Good afternoon. I'd like to talk to you today about the Grashoff condition, which is a condition that will tell you a great deal about the behavior of a four-bar linkage. And first, I'd like to describe what it does and doesn't do. It applies only to the four-bar linkage. We've already investigated in class some linkages that have more than four bars, but this condition will apply only to the four-bar. It will predict behavior of the linkage based only on the lengths of the links, no other constraints. And it will be entirely independent of the order of the interconnections of the links. And in addition, it's independent of the inversion. That is to say, which link is grounded. Now, if you take any four links and label them according to their relative lengths, with S being the shortest, L being the longest, call one of the others P and the remaining one Q, or any arbitrary letters you desire. Then, if this Grashoff inequality is true, that is, if the sum of the lengths of the shortest and the longest links is less than or equal to the sum of the lengths of the other two links, if that be true, then it will be a Grashoff linkage, no matter how you assemble it. If this inequality is false, then it will not be a Grashoff linkage. Now, if we take these particular four links, which I've labeled as described, shortest, longest, upside down, not that it makes any difference, and the other two, and very easily, graphically, we can determine that the sum of the longest and shortest is less than the sum of the other two. Therefore, when I assemble these links, I will get a Grashoff linkage, no matter how I put them together. The next question becomes, how many unique ways can we put them together? If we take one link as the ground, and I'm going to do this right here, so I'll cover some of that up. Just take any link as ground, let's say the Q link, down here. I'll make Q be right side up. And I want to now attach the remaining three links in some fashion. Well, if I have a link which has only two nodes, these are each binary links, and I'm going to attach them with only full joints, then I can only put two links into juxtaposition with the link that I've chosen as ground, which is the Q link. So I could, if I wished, attach S and P, as you see here, to link Q. Or, alternatively, I could attach L and P or S and L. And mathematically, we could talk about that in the following way, after having done it by brute force and ignorance, as we just did, by considering that I'm talking about combinations of three things, which are the remaining three links, taken two at a time. And the combinatorial formula is the number of things that you have factorial over the number taken together at a time factorial, and also in the denominator the difference between the number of links that are things that you have and the number of, that you are taking together. And if we do that calculation, we do see that there are three possible combinations, okay, which we just demonstrated. And we can sketch that in this way as well. If we consider the link to be a node, if you will, and look at the interconnections that we can make. If I take S as my ground link, then I could either put P on one end and Q on the other, or P and L, or Q and L. And in any given case, if I put P and Q, the only link remaining is L, and I would get that chain, S, P, L, and Q. So that's one possibility. S, P, Q, L is a second possibility. SQPL is the third possibility. 
Now, order makes no difference. We're talking about combinations, not permutations. So SQPL is the same combination as LPQS. It doesn't matter whether you go around this loop clockwise or counterclockwise. It's the same animal. Now, if I put those together in this order, we will have the three possible linkages. SPLQ looking like that, SPQL looking like that, SQPL looking like that. Now, I also have made cardboard models of those, which I'll show you in a moment. But let's look again at Grashoff's law, which says that the sum of the shortest and longest must be less than the sum of the other two links. And if that's true, then it is a Grashoff linkage, which means that, look at this first, one link will make a complete revolution with respect to the other three. That's the basic Grashoff rule. It says that one link will be able to make a full 360 degree revolution. If the Grashoff condition is not true, then con conversely you can say that no link can make a full revolution, and that's what makes it a useful linkage, the fact that a link can make a full revolution. Now, if we look a little bit further into the results of this Grashoff condition, we'll find that depending upon which link we ground, we will get three possible kinds of motion out of the Grashoff linkage. Now, this is true only if it is Grashoff. I will get a crank rocker, I'll get a double crank, or a double rocker. No other possibilities. And I will get one of these three dependent on which link I ground, or another way of saying that, which inversion I use. And I'll demonstrate that right now. If we have a Grashoff combination, which we have here, these are the same links we just looked at, S, P, Q, and L. And I've just taken an arbitrary combination, SPLQ, in this particular case. And it will be true no matter which combination I use. And I have now grounded one of the links, namely Q, which happens to be adjacent to the link S. And the rule says that I will get a crank rocker if I ground either link adjacent to the shortest, P or Q. All right, let's see if that's true. I will rotate S. Notice that S, I'll get my finger out of the way so you can see it a little bit better. Notice that S in all cases will be the one that makes the full revolution, it being the shortest. Now S is doing a 360 and you'll notice that the link labeled L is rocking back and forth between some limits perhaps going through 45 degrees or thereabouts. Link P has a much more complicated and interesting motion, which uh, we'll save for a later discussion. This is called a crank rocker because S, making a full revolution, is a crank. That's another term for a link which can go through 360. And L is obviously rocking back and forth. Now, this is an example of uh, your windshield wiper mechanism on your automobile, for example, where the motor that drives it would be attached to link S, causing it to turn in a full revolution, and L would be the link that would contain or have attached to it your windshield wiper blade. Now, I want to reinforce the point that it makes no difference which of the combinations we, we use, so I'm going to also take one of the others and show you that it also is a crank rocker even though the order of interconnections is different. This is SPQL instead of the one we just had. And as soon as I get it tacked down here and get my mechanical hand, we will it's stubbing its toe on the little rivet there. That's why there's some resistance, but you can see again that S is making a full revolution, and this time Q is the rocker. L happens to be the ground. Now, this says if you ground either 
link adjacent to the fixed link, we will get a crank and rocker. Well, let's check that by moving my holder over here to the other end of S and sticking my thumbtack as a pivot in to either end of P. I just noticed that I must turn the whole mess upside down for that to work, so hang on just a minute. And we will put this in over here, and this in over here. And now, when I rotate this, I again get a crank and rocker. Now, having had to turn it upside down, I don't have the letters on this side, but you may remember that the longest one, L, was the one that I had previously pinned down, and Q, uh, P was moving, and I have, in this case, pinned down P. L is connecting S to Q. Q is again the rocker. Let me put the labels on them right now. This is Q, this is P, this is L, and this is S. Okay, eliminate that confusion. Same kind of motion, but in, if you remember what the motion of Q looked like before, which you probably don't, it didn't go through the same angle as it is going through now. As a result of grounding P instead of L, I'm getting a different amount of motion out of Q. Same kind, but different amount. So it is, in fact, a slightly different linkage. So we're going to get two crank rockers, then, out of a Grashoff, depending upon which of the links adjacent to the shortest link we pin down to the ground plane. Now, if we ground the shortest link in any of these, we will get a linkage which is called variously a double crank or a drag link. You may have heard the term drag link in respect to your automobile because there is such a, a linkage in there. Now, one interesting characteristic of the drag link, or double crank, since it is a double crank, both P and Q in this particular instance are making a full revolution. And you remember that the Grashoff condition said that to get a hold of that link again, said that one link would make a full revolution, and that link would typically be S. And how we see P and Q making complete revolutions, that seems to put the lie to the statement about the Grashoff condition, which I made before. But it really doesn't, because if you think about all of these motions being relative motions, then you can say that S is making a full revolution relative to all of the other links, including P and Q. But because we happen to be standing on S as our ground, it appears to be stationary, and everything else appears to be going around in circles, L included. That kind of gets back to the argument about whether the Earth goes around the Sun or the Sun goes around the Earth. It depends upon where you're standing. But this drag link will always result if you ground the shortest link, and that will be true no matter which of the combinations you use. The one remaining possibility is that which occurs when we ground the link opposite the shortest link. And here's a combination which I haven't used as yet, so I'll try that one. And I'm going to ground the link that's opposite the shortest, which in this case is P. And now the rule says I will get a double rocker meaning that the two links attached to ground, in this case Q and L, will be rocking back and forth, not capable of making a full revolution. But the rule for Grashoff says that at least one or one link will make a full revolution, and you see that S is doing a flip. That kind of hard to see when a letter S is upside down, isn't it? We put an arrow on that so we can determine direction. And as I rock that P, uh, Q and L back and forth, you can see the arrow is going to turn over. All right, that's our remaining 
third possibility, double rocker, in which the coupler makes a complete revolution. That distinguishes it from some other possible double rockers. All right, what are our applications of these things? Well, the crank rocker is used probably more than any other linkage in machinery in cases where you would like to have as an output an oscillating or oscillatory motion. And for input, you usually want to go to the store and buy an inexpensive motor. And motors like to go around in circles, so your input then wants to be continuous rotation. Yet your output is most likely going to want to be oscillatory. Again, your windshield wiper being a simple example. Moving materials on an assembly line in and out of position is another example in which the crank rocker is a natural. So uh, another couple that you may be familiar with are the electric shaver and the sewing machine, both of which use crank rocker type mechanisms in them. Now a double crank or drag link is used in any case where you want to get a rotary output, full revolution output, with a full revolution input. However, for some reason you wish to change the velocity of the output vis-a-vis -vis the input. Motors, which are very common sources for the power input to mechanisms of this sort, tend to want to run at constant speed. And in a given case, you may not want to have constant speed for your output. The drag link will allow you to get that conversion. Automobile steering mechanisms are an example in which drag links are used. The Grashoff double rocker has very little practical application, largely because the link that is making the full revolution is not attached to ground, and it's very difficult to get any kind of motor or other driving device attached to it. Let's look at the non-Grashoff case now, in which the sum of the shortest and longest link is greater than the sum of the other two. And I have here an example of that. The, the rule now is that no link can make a full revolution with respect to the others. And no matter which link I ground, I will get nothing but double rockers. So let's see if that's true. Here's our four links in some arbitrary order of connection. And I will attempt to move Q to the right. And it will not go because S and P are aligned. The Q has gone as far to the right as it can go. If I go to the left with Q, it will move. And it will move until it gets down into the condition again in which S and P are aligned. And it will not go any further. I have no choice but to bring Q back the other way. And again, it will go only until S and P are aligned. Now that will be true no matter which inversion I choose. Now I've been using L as the ground. Let's use Q as the ground and see what happens. I'll move L. Well, L does not want to go. I just bent the cardboard in attempting to make it go, but it doesn't want to go any further to the left than it is now. However, I can go to the right and bring it down here until, again, S and P are in line. So I'm going to get four double rockers out of this, no link making a full revolution. Now, it might seem that there's little application for that kind of device, but in fact, it's used quite widely. Your automobile is full of them. Uh, your auto suspension system probably has double rocker mechanisms in it since the linkage which supports your wheels with respect to the body of the car, or vice versa, typically does not make a full revolution. You don't want your wheel flipping over upside down when you go over a bump. So the amount of motion that the wheel goes through is relatively limited, and therefore a double rocker is perfectly adequate. Your hood linkage in your car is also an example of the use of a double rocker folding chairs, and any number of other possibilities. Now, the one remaining condition which we need to look at very briefly is the condition when the sum of the shortest and longest are equal, which means it's still a Grashoff, because if you recall the inequality, it said less than or equal to. 
if I have the same sum for both pairs, and here I've labeled them P and Q and P and Q, rather than S and L, since they are the same length. Now I get some rather strange results. I'll pin this down to try and control it a little bit better. And I'll start to move P around. And when I get to the point where they are all in line, and of course they are all in line at once, if I'd made that more carefully, they'd be more willing to go into this position, but I've got a little error in the lens. They're not exactly the same. They are now in a an indeterminate position because I can drive them either this way into a crossed mode or I can drive them this way into an open mode from that position. So when I get to this all links aligned condition, the further motion of the linkage is indeterminate. And this is called a changeover point or change point. And if you tried to use this as a double crank, which it in fact is, you see I can take those around if I help it through the change points. And if you try to use this in a practical application without doing something to ensure that it gets through the change points, you may get some rather strange results. There is one very old and common application of this particular parallelogram double crank linkage, which you may have seen uh, on steam locomotives used to interconnect the drive wheels. The way they got around the problem with the change points in that instance was to have on one side of the locomotive a set of parallel cranks, as these are sometimes called, in that position, let's say, and on the other pair of drive wheels, they were 90 degrees out of phase, so that as one side was going through its change point position, the other side was carrying it through, being 90 degrees out of phase. So it is a practical, usable linkage, and if you've ever seen a drafting machine, I think you've seen this linkage as well. Of course, in that application, it doesn't make a full revolution so you avoid the change point problem. And here, I mentioned that it's used in drafting machines. Pantographs as well. A pantograph being something that is used to change the scale. And in the case of a pantograph, you would add another parallel linkage, parallelogram linkage to this, and you would pivot only one, and I can move that around. And these will trace similar shapes. And if I add another stage to that, I can get a multiplication or a reduction in size. In summary, then, we have a very simple test, a very simple inequality. S plus L less than or equal to P plus Q. And it tells an amazing amount about a four-bar linkage before you ever assemble it. It tells you whether any link can fully rotate, it tells you whether any change points exist. It tells you what kind of motions will be possible. And they will be, if, it is a, if this is true, either a crank rocker, a double crank, or a double rocker. If this is false, it can only be a double rocker.